For this segment, we're going to be reviewing Superintelligence, a book by Oxford philosophy professor Nick Bostrom. To begin this book, Bostrom goes back through the history of computing and AI in general, starting with days of Turing, through to Deep Blue, the chess playing algorithm, through to the kind of AI headlines of today, things like IBM's Watson and AlphaGo. But Bostrom isn't really interested in these kinds of specific use cases of AI. Instead, what he really cares about is when will AI reach a general level of intelligence that's smarter than anyone with humanity. Bostrom's kind of predictions of what could happen when we reach this phase have been very influential to people like Elon Musk. Absolutely. Before we get into the doom and gloom scenarios, we should lay out the framework that Nick Bostrom uses for superintelligence. So there are three types of superintelligence he thinks about. The first is brain emulation. This is a really cool concept where we take a brain, slice it into billions of pieces, and then map each of the neurons. This will effectively create a mechanical brain, and then we could have warehouses full of these mechanical brains that we would use in concert to create the superintelligence. The next type is using genetic engineering. So we would take existing human embryos and then very rapidly iterate over generations of humanity. In the time span, it would take about one generation today. So effectively, in this model, we've created a superintelligence out of existing humans. And then finally, he talks about the synthetic or the code-based AI. This is what most people think about when they think about an AI. And this is the superintelligence that Nick Bostrom sees to be the most likely. All of these things come together to ask the central question, which is how do we handle the crossover point? And the crossover point is the point at which humanity will not be the smartest entity on planet Earth. We'll have this superintelligence out there. How can we control it? Adam. So Bostrom runs through a variety of kind of academic scenarios regarding the crossover point. He considers first, what if there's a slow transition over a period of decades or even centuries, AI just slightly improves to where one day it's now super intelligent and smarter than humanity. But he also considers things like a fast transition, where in a period of weeks or even days, a promising AI project suddenly blooms into this dangerous superintelligence, dangerous in particular because we wouldn't have had much time to plan for it. Um, but Bostrom does talk about things we can do to kind of mitigate the effects of AI. He talks about boxing methods, stunting methods to try and uh, diminish the AI's power and make it safer for us. But overall, you can't help but come away from this book feeling that if there's a superintelligent AI, there's not a whole lot we can do to stop it. Absolutely. The danger here is that any superintelligence we build has the potential to be amoral. So in the case of a synthetic AI, it's not that the machine will be out to kill us, it's just that it might do it by accident. Um, in the case of this synthetic AI, it's going to have a single objective function. It's going to use its algorithms to maximize that. So we have to be very careful about how we think about questions that we're posing to the machine. So in a scenario that's walked through in the book, we ask the question, hey, how do we make more paperclips? Uh, superintelligence, please make us more paperclips. And the superintelligence says, that's fine, and then proceeds to use every available resource in the universe, destroying the universe to create more paperclips. And then you can say, okay, well, that's a little bit far-fetched. We would put some constraints on it. We would say, don't harm humans, or we would say, you know, only use these available resources. But then you get in this really interesting scenario where maybe the machine says, okay, I took all the constraints, but you didn't tell me you didn't want me to use the rare earth minerals to make my paperclips. And so now you have no access to those anymore. So all this is to, to say that it's very difficult to set up a system where you're asking a super intelligence the correct questions and getting the desired output. Yeah, uh, but I think all these somewhat kind of dire projections really do beg the question, going back to a transition period, of how long is this going to take? Um, and at least in my view, I don't think this is happening anytime soon. Uh, there's a few reasons for this. The first is that, as we noted, all the AI applications that have been built so far are highly specific. It's things like AlphaGo that are playing a particular board game, you can't really plug them into some other you know, task or, or test and expect them to perform well. And there's a lot of human intervention still. There's a lot of just data cleaning, processing, tuning of algorithms, with nowhere close in my mind to kind of a general intelligence. And, and part of that is that the math behind these things hasn't really changed all that much. We're still just fitting neural nets that you know, were developed in the 80s, except now we just have sort of better data and maybe more interesting questions we're asking. But overall, not that much has changed. And I'm worried that kind of a focus on you know, super intelligent AI and the impact it could have on humanity is going to distract us from things that really could end humanity. So these are things like a nuclear war, which doesn't necessarily have to be kind of an active strike with a participant, but it could come through an accident. You know, nuclear bombs have dropped out of planes before. Um, there have been a lot of near misses if you look at the history of the US's nuclear stockpile. You also have things like climate change, which could dramatically impact humanity. And for all of these reasons, I think there are pressing concerns for us that do not involve a super intelligent general AI. Yeah, absolutely. I think, though, the danger of the AI means that even though this is a long-term problem, it's something we should start considering now. Uh, in the example of the fast launch, we may not have a lot of time to decide what we want to do as one of these reinforcement learning machines goes from something that's rather benign to something that's very dangerous almost overnight. 
Um, and the one thing in the book that's called out that I thought was a bit glossed over was this reliance on a nanobot network or some way for the machine to physically interact with the real world. In Bostrom's examples, maybe the machine needs to run some experiments on the physical world to you know, understand the rules of physics, etc. And so to do that, um, we relies on this network, which I thought was a bit of a stretch to assume such a network would exist for the machine to manipulate. Uh, not only is this predicated now on the development of this highly advanced super intelligence, it's also predicated on the development of a very advanced bot network, which I saw, again, as a bit of a leap. So while I still think the general superintelligent AI is a long ways out, I will say this book made me at least take the possibility seriously. Bostrom is a philosophy professor, but this is not an abstract book. Instead, he takes a really concrete, quantitative look at some of the possible scenarios, um, and the level of his research is excellent. Bostrom also makes some very valid points when it comes to ethics in AI. He talks about how researchers need to be cognizant of the values they impart into any AI creation, as well as for controls on its use. But for any AI researcher that's, say, working for a police state or a negative entity, they really need to be responsible for the possible negative uses of technology they develop. And I think these points hold for, you know, a specific AI too. But having said that, Matt, I think the key question is, do you think a general superintelligent AI we created in the next 100 years or so? Absolutely. Humans will continue barreling ahead, developing these technologies, and as called out in the book, uh, people are incentivized to see these changes happen within their own lifetime. So while we maybe should perhaps show restraint and avoid some of these pitfalls, the reality is we'll continue going forward and there's not much we can really do about it. Uh, the biggest hope is that we'll have more research done by people like Bostrom to call out different things we should avoid. But in the end, I think this is something that we're going to go towards and we're going to very fast. Having said that, um, I would like to go ahead and preemptively welcome our new AI overlords. Um, we hope we can be of service. This has been Radon Talkers. Thank you for watching.